the Toronto Star. I'm Sabah Itazaz, and this matters. This is the story of the world's loneliest elephant and a world-famous pop star who saves him. Nope, not a Disney movie. This actually happened. Sher went to Pakistan last month in the middle of a pandemic to rescue and relocate an elephant whose freedom she's long been campaigning for. Kavan has been dubbed the world's loneliest elephant held in miserable conditions at a zoo in the Pakistani capital of Islamabad for more than three decades. Sikandar Karmani is the BBC's Pakistan correspondent and he's here now to tell us how it took several animal rights organizations, a court order and share to help win the freedom of the world's loneliest elephant. Hi Sikandar, thank you so much for joining me today all the way from Pakistan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So first of all, I am familiar with the story, but for our listeners, how did Kavan became the world's loneliest elephant? Tell me more about him. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not sure who first came up with this phrase, the world's loneliest elephant, but that's certainly what stuck with him. He came to Pakistan as a young elephant, perhaps just a year old. And this was back in 1985. And since then, he's been living in Islamabad Zoo in overall pretty miserable conditions. And his life got even worse eight years ago in 2012 when his mate died. That was the only other elephant in the zoo. That's where this description came from, the world's loneliest elephant, because he became very emotionally distressed. In fact, he would spend much of his time, even when I saw him just the other week, just swaying his head from side to side. If you didn't know what was happening, you might look as if he was dancing, perhaps. But actually, animal experts say that this is a, a really common sign of distress in elephants or a sign of boredom and psychological damage, that they're just constantly swaying their heads left to right in the same way that perhaps a human would kind of rock back and forth if they were, you know, had been traumatized in some way. To comfort themselves in a way. Exactly, exactly, exactly. It's very sad. I also read about this and you're talking about this as well. You know how a lot of children growing up thought a lot of them said he's a dancing elephant, but actually there were signs of distress and loneliness, which we'll get into more later as well. How did he end up in Pakistan? There's a very interesting historic angle as well to this, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I mean, so I, I always knew that Garvin had been a kind of state gift from Sri Lanka to Pakistan back in 1985. But what I hadn't realized until actually reading an article by a colleague fairly recently on the subject is that at the time in Pakistan, there was a military dictator called Zia al-Haq. He was, in fact, as you know, Sabah, he was a very right-wing Islamist dictator who has had kind of a, a huge impact on, many people would say, a kind of growing cultural conservatism in, in Pakistan. He also had a young daughter, and his young daughter had watched a Bollywood film called Hati Miri Sati, which I guess translates as The Elephant, My Friend, perhaps? Yes, yes, I've seen that. And so his young daughter had watched this film, had become enamored of the idea of elephants, and had always wanted an elephant or talked about getting an elephant. And one day, this military dictator leads his young daughter out into the backyard, blindfolded, and there's an elephant. The daughter says, can we keep it at home? And he says, no, it's for the Pakistani state. We can't look after it at home. So the elephant goes into the zoo. So it's this kind of strange dichotomy between this ruthless, really deeply controversial military dictator and, you know, the story of him trying to put a smile on his young daughter's face. Right, which did not bode very well for the elephant Absolutely. later on since he's been Absolutely. at the zoo since Absolutely. then. Yes. Yeah, tell me more about Coven's life. What was it like at the zoo? He was there for some 35 years, right? Why was this house so small? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, for a lot of that time, it seems he wasn't really cared for properly at all. At times he was left chained up. He was forced to perform. His diet wasn't good. You know, even when they were trying to move him, the charity that was involved in it that, you know, we'll go on to talk about later, they said that he was really obese because he had just been fed this awful diet, mainly of just sugar cane. And so visitors would come, they'd 
buy some sugar cane from the keepers and, and feed him. And that's not healthy. And the enclosure was, you know, it was really sparse. So the shelter that was over him wasn't really good enough to keep him protected either from the heat in the summer or from the cold in the winter. And there was nothing for him to do there, you know, especially after his mate died. And his mate died, it seems, really because of neglect. And to get an idea of, you know, how bad conditions could be at this zoo, just a few months ago, as they were relocating all the animals from the zoo, the zookeepers were trying to move some lions out from there. And bizarrely, instead of giving them tranquilizer darts or something, they decided to try and light fires in the cages and smoke them out. And the lions ended up dying. So this is horrible. But it just shows you how, you know, if that's the kind of stuff that's going on, then of course, this poor elephant was not getting the care and attention that he needed. It's kind of like the longest pandemic quarantine ever, right? Yeah, in exactly. A in a nasty place, you know, not in a nice luxury yeah. flat or a big mansion, but yeah, in a really, really kind of boring space. It's exactly the analogy, actually, one of the guys from this charity kind of made to me. He said, imagine you were just stuck somewhere. I suppose it's like being in a jail, really. Perhaps that's the best way of comparing it. It's quite a dismal picture, you know, of the life that Cummins had, but he wasn't completely friendless, right? There's been a lengthy battle to free him and find him a better home. And it's been going on for years. I've been seeing it during my time there as well. Tell me more about that. Definitely. There's often been civil society groups, animal rights groups that have been trying to raise some awareness about this, petitioning courts to either get the conditions improved or for him to be relocated. The social media campaign really, I think, took off around 2016 when there's some pictures of him being chained up. This was after his partner died as well. Went viral on the internet and he ended up with kind of over 400,000 people, I think, signing a petition calling for either his conditions to be improved or for him to be relocated. And that's where you get this, you know, pop superstar Cher getting involved because she somehow picks up with it from social media and gets behind the campaign to try and change Garvin's life. Right, the power of social media. And before Cher came into his life, there was also a certain vet who he developed a special bond with. Tell me more about that. That was very interesting. Yeah, so this is an Egyptian heritage vet working with an Austrian charity called Four Paws. And this charity is really interesting in itself. And this vet is really interesting as well because they specialize in relocating or evacuating animals from zoos in war zones. So, you know, I met him in Islamabad and he was telling me how they went into eastern Aleppo in the middle of the Syrian war to relocate animals from there, how they went into Mosul in Iraq when the, when the fight against ISIS was going on and relocated animals from there. So they've really been in the thick of it. But he did say that they haven't moved an animal quite as big as carbon. So this brought its own challenges, even if it's not in a, a war zone. But Dr. Khalil was saying that because Garvin was so, let's say, psychologically damaged, he needed a lot of attention. He needed kind of rehabilitation. And one of the ways he found in which to communicate with Garvin was by singing to him. And this is <laughs> he, it's quite funny because, you know, Dr. Khalil, I think, would be the first person to say he is not got a, he's not a particularly accomplished singer. He's a, an enthusiastic <laughs> singer. You know, he would say, oh, my children find it hilarious that I'm singing because you know, no one would ever want to hear me sing normally. But he would sing to him. And in particular, he latched on to this song by Frank Sinatra, My Way. And now the end is near. I state my case. Which I am certain. Which is, you know, quite poignant in some ways. And so he would sing that to him and they formed a real bond over these last four months as they were first assessing Garvin and seeing whether he could be taken out of Pakistan, whether he was medically fit enough and then working on that relocation process itself. We'll be right back. we come to Cher. How does she come into the picture? How does a music queen, a music icon from across the world sort of fall in love with a lonely elephant all the way in Pakistan and take up his cause? 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of these incredible stories, isn't it? You know, it sounds like the beginning of a, of a strange joke, you know, the, the elephant, the pop sensation <laughs> and, and Pakistan. I think this, it goes back to this social media campaign in 2016, raising awareness about carbon. And, and Cher, from what I can see, is someone who's had an interest in animal rights. She's co-founded a charity called Free the Wild. And so she has this interest in it. And she really began then spearheading the kind of publicity campaign around it. And her charity has been very involved in the legal fight to try and get Garvin freed and relocated. And how did the rescue finally come about? Did they have to prepare Coven for the trip? The key development that happened was earlier this year, it was a court case in the Islamabad High Court and a judge there basically said, look, the conditions in this zoo are just not good enough for any animal to be kept here. So he said, I want all the animals in the zoo to be relocated, including Garvin. Of course, Garvin was the most high profile animal there. It was after that that we saw this tragic incident of these lions dying, in fact. Partly because of that, I think, because of that incident with the lions, this charity, Four Paws International, with this expertise in relocating animals worldwide, became to be involved. And they came over, they carried out assessments on him, on Garvin, and then they began preparing him. And preparing him was a difficult job because, you know, you've got a, a five and a half or five ton elephant and you're you're trying to relocate him to a completely different country where he's got to fly. He can't be taken by road because it's too far away. He's going to Cambodia, not to a neighboring country. What I saw them do when I went down to the zoo a couple of weeks ago is they were trying to get him, they constructed a, a special crate for Garvin and the trainers were trying to get him used to going into the crate, spending time in the crate. Very good. Good boy. Very good. Very good. Very good. They were using a kind of reward system. So they would offer him a bit of food, some bananas or some, you know, some apples or something. Every time he obeyed their commands to try and get that association between doing what they say and getting a reward. So they managed actually quite quickly to get him inside the crate. I was surprised, but they were struggling to get him to go all the way to the end of the crate so that his nose was kind of pushed up against the grill and so that his feet would be in the exact right position because, you know, as I said, you're talking about a five ton animal and then you've got around a five ton or five and a half ton crate. So any kind of shifting from side to side that goes on on a plane is going to, you know, potentially be a problem for the pilot. So it was a big, big logistical challenge. One, two, three. Go, 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 go. Go, go. Yes. Well done. And this is all going on in the middle of a pandemic as well, which we need to remember. Yeah, absolutely. No one else is traveling. Just, you know, Cher and, <laughs> and, the, <laughs> Cher and the elephant. Yeah, exactly. And she was there. She was in Pakistan. I've seen some pictures and she spent some time with him, I'm guessing. Did he get to enjoy any of her greatest hits? He loves music, as we know. We didn't get to meet her, but she did come to the zoo. She did sing to the elephant. She has actually, I believe, written a, a few dedicated songs to Garvin. I have to confess, I haven't heard those songs. Uh, so I don't know if those are the ones that she sung to him, but she did definitely sing to him. I could not tell you what Garvin's reaction was, whether he approved of that <laughs> more than the vet Frank Sinatra is my way or not. But yeah, Cher is now, in fact, with him in Cambodia. This is amazing for him, you know, and now he will be free. He'll be in that jungle. His life is going to be the life of an elephant and not the life of a prisoner. So he's got more time to get used to her singing, I imagine. Right. And and maybe there's a new album in the offing for Cher. Who knows <laughs> what comes yeah, out of exactly. this? Exactly. Maybe a duet with the elephant. <laughs> right? Why not? Why not? And like you said, she was there in Cambodia to greet him as well. Tell me more about this new home that he's now going to be spending his life in, in Cambodia. Yes, it's going to be really different from this, as I said, this sparse enclosure that he's been in here in Islamabad. It's a 25,000 acre, huge wildlife sanctuary. There are three other elephants who are already there. My understanding is that the initial plan will be to keep him in a kind of large enclosure until he adjusts a bit into the environment. And then once that's happened, then he those kind of walls and barriers around the enclosure will be brought down and he will be kind of left to roam in an even wider space. So it will be much more like a natural habitat. In fact, I've already seen some videos that this charity Four Paws was, was sharing on social media of Garvin looking, it seems much happier. And, you know, even from what I've been able to gather from speaking to people involved in the care of animals, it's really important for them to have things to interact with. So he was just playing, for example, with a huge tire 
in Cambodia, it's not, I mean, I guess it's not something that an elephant normally encounters in their natural environment, but it is still something to interact with, something to flip over, something to poke around, something to stimulate yourself with. Whereas before in Islamabad, there was literally nothing for him to do, which is why I think he was so bored and you got this kind of um, swaying of his head from side to side because of this boredom and this loneliness. Right, and I think we can develop a special empathy to his situation considering this COVID-19 situation and being in quarantine and we're all looking for something and someone to interact with, right? So he's... And he doesn't even have Netflix or something. Right? You know? So you can't, <laughs> you can't just tune into that. It's like been a tough can. life. <laughs> and from what I'm hearing, hearing with the videos from this organization that you're talking about, he's already made a friend there, a sort of a female elephant called Deepu. What else have you been hearing about how he's doing so far? Yes, I saw this picture. It's a very cute picture uploaded on social media of the two trunks kind of intertwining. You know, I think someone someone wrote on Twitter, wow, Garvin moves fast. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like he's, he's from Pakistan. Really... <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's been lonely for a long time. So. Right? <laughs> right. So, he, you know, he seems to be already, from what we can see, doing a lot better, which is what you would hope for. And, you know, I was asking the guys from the charity what his future life would be like and whether they think he can rehabilitate and readjust, given that he's been kind of almost, I suppose, institutionalized for so many decades. And they were saying, look, elephants live for a long time. So, you know, he's 36 years old. You know, you expect him to live to 60, 70. So they're confident that he will have a happy life now, now that he's out in the, you know, more or less in the wild and in a more natural environment. And most importantly, with other elephants, because elephants are really social creatures, just like we are. They need that interaction. And that's what he'd been missing out on. Right, but what's 35 years in an elephant's life, right? Although they never forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe he wants to forget, I suppose, because it's not much has happened, certainly, over the last last eight years. Right, right. And Sikandar, it's obviously been a tough time for Pakistan, like the rest of the world, and you've been covering a lot of it from that region. How was it for you covering this happy ending, almost fictional story from Pakistan with a year that's been filled with the pandemic and other political turmoils that are common? there yeah i mean look it's been it's of course it's always great to have a, a happy story as you know so far i mean as journalists most of the work that we do or, or the work that we often focus on and rightly so is about pointing out injustice or, or, or pointing out problems in the world or raising concerns about something that's happening and all that stuff is really important but it's always lovely it's always refreshing to get something with a happy ending and especially when you're reporting in the developing world because it's so rare to have happy endings you know because there's there is just so much that's kind of unfair going on and so you know even speaking to colleagues back in london everyone was so excited about this story because they thought right 2020 has been such an awful year for so many people at least if, if this poor elephant gets some kind of happy ending, it's, it's something that we can vicariously live through. So no, it's, it's been great. I should also say though, you know, in Pakistan, there is a tinge of sadness that people have that, well, what does this say about us that we couldn't look after this elephant, that we couldn't treat him better, that we couldn't, you know, have him here. People, I think, are generally happy that Garvin is going to be happier and is in a better place. But I think there is also that, that reflection that it's a sorry state of affairs that the country wasn't able to better provide for him whilst he was here. And it is a time for self-reflection for us all. But at the same time, there were all these people in Pakistan who I've known who've been fighting for him for years. So there's always that silver lining. There's always going to be champions and fighters in Pakistan trying to do the right thing too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's a testament to all their hard work. And of course, you know, Cher gets the publicity and she's been a very important part in raising awareness. But it's down to a lot of hard work by Pakistani animal rights activists and others and who've been pressing for this in the courts and, and in protests and, you know, trying to raise their voice on behalf of carbon. <laughs> It's a real testament to their dedication to the cause. Well, I guess we all needed this happy ending story this year really badly. Thank you so much, Sikander, for talking to me. This has been great. This story and this talk with you has left me very happy. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. And hopefully we'll, um, we'll check back in in a few years' time. Maybe Garvin will have some babies or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's look to that. Thank you so much, Sikander. You stay safe. Likewise. Take care. Take care. I was talking to the BBC's Pakistan correspondent, Sikandar Karwani.
that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazas, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.